This is the Dog Savant Podcast with your host, Brett Endes. Hey everyone, welcome to the Dog Savant Podcast. I am Brett Endes. I'm your host. This is episode 35. Uh, I am a problem behavior specialist. I'm a dog trainer. I'm based here in Los Angeles. I always like to talk about that so you know who, who you're listening to. Uh, I myself have been doing this for a very long time, over 20 years. Uh, I specialize in working with you know, some cases such as aggression, anxiety, reactivity, even puppies, teaching owners how to raise them properly. And what I do on this podcast and all my other online content is really just try to share the information that's helped dog owners in the real world to hopefully help as many dogs here and owners like yourself listening and supporting what I do here. So thank you so much. And uh, with that said, please continue to support if you're a new listener. Don't forget to uh, subscribe, share, review. Um, I have a podcast that we do here on iTunes if you're listening. We also have a YouTube version as well so you can get a video uh, type of type of uh, episode as well. Uh, but continue listening. We got more content. Last episode, uh, we had Robert Masters, professional dog trainer on. We're going to have more guests. Uh, it's really great. It's gaining some momentum. So keep listening. Good stuff to, uh, to come here. Um, okay, so uh, a few episodes back, I started doing my book. Uh, let me explain again. Uh, I have for many years tried my best to write a book and I have been struggling. I am not that good at writing down what I can talk about freely when a dog and owner is in front of me doing my job. Um, I can organize the thoughts, the information, create a system and structure things so that the owners can learn and be able to do this and take it away for their own you know, needs You know, when they're living with their pets and applying it. But when it comes time to sitting down and writing about it, it's a little more challenging. As evidenced by, I had a book deal about 10 years ago, tried writing a manuscript, it was not very successful, didn't end up with the deal after they had originally given it to me, and I've been taking a few cracks at this before, but this is gonna be it. Uh, you guys are gonna help me with this, I'm gonna get this thing out here. Why? I'm writing an outline, I'm spending 10 minutes a day, I'm being held accountable by another person who's you know really supporting me, and you know, I'm gonna get this done. We're gonna have this done in 2019, but this podcast, what I want to do is break it down into little modules so when I'm doing certain episodes here, so this is going to be the book part three, uh, and all the episodes are just going to be me talking more freely about all of these different subjects that I've outlined here, uh, at least in a rough way to get the things going here, to give a framework uh, on what I really want this book to be, and it really is just going to try to be an A to Z coverage of all of the different issues, elements, the all the things dog owners need to know if they're dealing with everyday real life dog problems or lack of listening or how to raise their puppy properly so they don't have these these behavior problems. So that's the point of what I do. That's the point of this book. And I want to organize this here. And I figure if I can get this out there, you know, a little more clearly, I can transcribe it and just continue piecing together this so I can get a nice full lexicon of, of you know, everything accumulated that I understand of dogs uh, and their behavior, you know, in, in all these years I've been doing this. Okay, so uh, that's the reasoning. Let's get into it. So uh, last episode uh, that we talked about this was, I believe, episode 32. Uh, we left off with just talking about some exercise and just basic. Uh, let me go back here just so I'm really on point. I think it was just some some of the um, ideas of exercise. Uh, I think we're talking about like different collars and equipment and all that as well. So We've got that covered, and now we're going to start talking about actual walking. So let me get back down here. Pardon me for not being as organized as I could be, but we're going to do a little walking here. So pulling. So let's start. So leash-related walking problems. This is chapter six. Uh, first section, pulling. Mm, explain how dogs overproject and overanticipate. Now, I've talked about this in depth in many of my walking episodes so you know maybe it'd be good to pull some of the information from those past uh, podcasts as well and many other videos i've made on youtube talking demonstrating uh, about you know why dogs pull and how this pulling issue is so misunderstood and can lead to some severe issues like reactivity lunging aggression social issues you know inability to get out in the world with their owners and they miss out on a big part of their life and they're miserable when they do have to deal with it uh, so, you know, walking is really important. It's the foundation of 
many, many, uh, you know, good things, you know, as far as the relationship you can establish in your dog, but it could also lead to a lot of other problems. So you got to walk your dog properly. So pulling. So with that, um, I have here, uh, explain how dogs over project and over anticipate. So what they do is dogs have that mental rubber band issue where they're thinking so ahead. I always tell my clients that the dogs anticipate themselves already down the street walking before you even open the door to leave the house and their body feels so propelled forward like a slingshot it's like a mental rubber band and that's what hunting is doing is these dogs are just projecting at a focal point zeroing in and their body most efficiently goes towards that which is good for those needs or others that are more you know you send a utility utility based um, but not just navigation based as far as navigating everyday life in the society we live with our dogs because if they get too ahead they keep going and if it becomes a bad habit you really have some issues you know related to walking so uh, over projection over anticipation you really have to teach a dog calm focus command teach him to heal teach him to pay attention more to you and the moment not thinking 10 steps ahead all the time and you'll see that they tend to filter a lot of what's what they encounter whether it be exciting stimuli they see a new person and they just have to run and jump towards them or if they see a dog and they react in a negative way which we'll cover more in the chapters on specific reactivity um yeah and then with that you know uh it really is a mental focus issue more than an actual physical phenomena or personal choice. And that's what I wrote down there, which is very, very important to mention. So with that, I do mention reactivity uh, in this leash-related walking problems episode, uh, episode uh, chapter. And uh, this one, I call it, quote, road rage for dogs. And it is, because if you're, you're heightened, and I drive a lot for my work, and sometimes I have a bad day, and I'm just amped up, and something that I normally wouldn't be affected by, it's on. I just, what the, you get upset. And that's really what it is. It's like a hypervigilance that's gone too awry, that's uncontrolled, and then when some extra stimuli kind of startle responses you, it's just on, right? And that's what these dogs, they go blind when they, let's say, encounter another dog on a walk. And you have to teach them to be calm, Put on some classical music, relax, you'll get there when you get there. That's how the walk has to be, a calm, chill experience, not road rage inducing. Uh, dogs who walk in an overstimulated, anticipatory state are more likely to be reactive. Well, they sure are, as I explained earlier, so that's really important to address that. And a lot of preemptive training, a lot of warm-up, a lot of prep for the walk, a lot of leading your dog through the door threshold to get outside, very important. Okay, so... Continuing with reactivity, uh, reactivity, I wrote, I spelled it reactivity, reactivity, I thought I spelled it right. Oh, well, it's not the same as aggression. It's not. Aggression is different. Um, we talk more about that as well in the book. But reactivity is more of an overstimulation or that external response that's gone to extreme that's why a lot of dogs, let's say with a, on a leash, they're so hypervigilant they react to dogs, but off leash they're fine and comfortable. That hypervigilance protecting their owner, their home, certain environments, it kicks in, resources, and then they're fine when it's all passed. So it's not even, you know, they're learning a skill. They just have to turn off that per se hypervigilance <clears throat> to replace, you know, it with conscious understanding of what's going on. And it's just sometimes the root of it starts with a calmer walk, more leadership in the everyday home environment through social interactions, greetings, whatnot. Um, so it's not the same as aggression. Um, and then four, I put here Roman numerals. Most dogs who are leash reactive are okay with dogs off lead. And I, it says, explain why this is so, I just did. It's, it's really the context in most cases. And this is just patterns I've seen as a professional dog trainer. Uh, lunging, uh, it's still, it's space creating, controlling, or tampering behavior. They want to push back something that they feel is too much to deal with. Or they want to make space or control its movement or tamper it. And that's why a lot of dogs like to pin a dog down when they're frustrated. You know, they'll bark and stand over them. Um, they want to tamper the movement. It's like a herding instinct gone too far as well. Um, why, okay, so D, section D here. Why do no, under the uh, walking related issues uh, chapter. Why do no pull devices, uh, why, why they do not work? Uh, they don't address the underlying above-mentioned root causes that I'm talking about here. Um, and it, of why the dogs pull, react on the leash, and, and it doesn't teach proper walking skills based on focus and leadership. And I know leadership is a 
dirty word here, but it really is important for your dog to feel that you're going to deal with it first and foremost, and you're better equipped to navigate. And if heaven forbid it's threatening or something they have to protect you by, let them see your response, engage it by, okay, that's not normally how they would deal with it. Then wait and see what happens. But if it's like, oh, mom, dad is just walking normally, well, they're being a good leader because they're seeing it consciously instead of, oh gosh, they're holding a leash and I'm frustrated and this harness is making me feel more physical control, but I pull against it and I can't focus, not going to help at all, right? So you have to get this focus connection and the big, big L word leadership uh, associated with the walk. Uh, but that's why no pull devices don't work is because they don't address why a dog pulls. It's like putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Big one, Band-Aid on the problem. All right, so what is the solution then, Mr. Dog Trainer Guy, who is talking about things that don't work and why dogs do what they do? Well, it's teaching a heel, if you will, command to replace these issues, to preempt the walk with a nice focus, to use focus to lead their dog and even the heel command to lead a dog around the house to get all their basic needs if you're reestablishing better habits and a rehabilitation, you know, or deep-rooted training program to, to fix some, you know, major problem behaviors in your dog. Um, so you have to do that. It's, it's used to teach a dog to focus. Follow our lead on a walk while maintaining a consistent position via command. In essence, they're, look, they're, they're following the back of your leg. So it's like a little horse blinder, if you will, and everything's more filtered by not having that mental rubber band shoot down the street and then all of a sudden they're just slingshotting their body because we're not promoting focus. And you're not choking them to do that. You're not correcting. You're getting focus. You're promoting this and building it like a muscle. You can use some treats, but you're also shaping them to understand that if you want to get ahead, you have to stay at my pace. And then there's counter techniques. You can turn around, stop and sit, slow down, but teach them with your patience, consistency, and understanding and timing how to get what they need, which the reward in itself could be just moving ahead and getting the walk accomplished and the calmer, less anxious state associated with it. Okay. It's been a long one. This is our third podcast of the day. So we had, we, we uh, kind of put him, put a lot together today. Jordan came over and we wanted to get a lot done. So petering out, trying to keep it going here for this last one, guys. Sorry, my voice, a little hoarse, kind of running out of steam, but I'm going to get it. We're almost done here, guys. I want to get through this. This one section here, the leash walking stuff is so important. Um, okay, so the heel and its use of consistency for your command. And it's, it's again, it's ideal for dogs to have a habit of scanning, pulling, reacting, etc. I want to talk about how dogs don't have to be sniffing all the time. You can give them time to sniff on command. You can tell them when to potty. You can tell them when and when not to socialize. They don't have to lead and rush up to every dog that they see. They can follow rules. And you're looking in the, the now society. It's like the opposite is what's popular. And it's not helping any dogs. It really isn't. So, uh, you know, be, be, be an advocate for your dog. Don't worry if people think you're being rude because you won't let them pet your dog or tell them, well, my dog has to be calm before meeting you or your dog and can't rush up to you and you can't be in an excited state because you feel so great that you're willing to overstimulate my dog who maybe isn't going to be happy with that. You know, little things like that. But more people, I think, I just in my last podcast with Robert, we're talking about how things are shifting back in the other way, the pendulum of like people are not going to get away with being so self-indulgent or entitled in public and people, even with their dogs, are giving a little pushback. So good for them. You know, good for you if you're doing it too. Uh, I do these get out there with your dog videos and I want to do more in public just to even show how to get out there in a training context, you know, with your dog and how to interact if there are people who come up and ask. And if you explain, you know, politely, of course, what you're trying to do and how they can or can't help and what they're trying to accomplish, their response tells a lot about them as an individual. Anyway, we spoke a lot about that stuff in last podcast. I want to keep it about this book. Um... But uh, anyway, so that we're going to leave it at that. We're going to do the, uh, we're going to leave it right here at least. We're going to break this down into really, really small little things. Uh, I would say that because this podcast just talked about the general topics of the book, I'm going to give you a, uh, let me see. If you bear with me for one second, I'm going to give you maybe another supplemental podcast that you can do here. Okay, so episode 14. The Benefits of Structured Walking. I did that back in September 18. That's a good one to complement this this uh, one I just did. It gives you more details of how to actually walk your dog specifically. Um, oh, let's see. And episode two, our second episode of the uh, Dogs of On podcast. 
That one is walking your dog. I think that would be good too. We do a lot of this in my show, The Untrainables, on Facebook Watch. We uh, finished last uh, first season last month, waiting to hear on a second season, so wish me luck on that. Uh, but we do, if you check that out, it's maybe a more like watered down version of what I you know, get in more detail about in the podcast and my YouTube videos and of course when I'm working with my clients and workshops and all that. But um, anything to help, you know, and oh, for you guys, uh, I can't stress enough, send me your questions, email me at dogtrainingla at gmail.com or reach out to me on Facebook, The Dog Savant. You can go onto my uh, Instagram at The Dog Savant, I don't promote that enough. YouTube, uh, that one's Dog Training LA. My website is dogtrainingla.com. Uh, Patreon is patreon.com backslash the dog savant. And more importantly, share this podcast, tell your friends, get more people listening, um, and keep training your dog. This is great. You know, some of you people have actually been telling me how some of the information I'm sharing with you applied has helped your dogs and sending me videos and pictures and thank yous and I love it. That's why I do this. So keep them coming. Thank you to my real world clients too. I really hope that these podcasts can help you guys also. Uh, anyone who wants to give me some feedback or ideas on the book, you know, please as well. Um, I know these ones might be a little boring because I'm just kind of reading my outline here, but I hopefully you can pull a bitter piece out of it too. And it, like I said, it's going to help me. It's going to help this book you know, get put together in a better way, you know, than all these attempts I've made in the past. I think this is going to be the solution. And um, thanks again, guys. Thank you to Jordan for helping me with my podcast. If you need a good podcast guy or a video guy or a production guy, Jordan at, was that, Respect Jordan? Yep, on Instagram. On it's at Respect Jordan. J -O, no dashes or hyphens or anything. Mm -hmm. At Respect Jordan. And I'll at mention him. You'll see if I post him on mine at The Dog Savant. And uh, thanks again, guys. Thanks for listening. This has been Podcast 35 of the Dog Savant Podcast. Have a good day.